Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, welcome to Iran's today panel under the title of Trade in National Currencies, Challenges and Opportunities. First of all, I would like to use this opportunity and introduce Iran very briefly before we start the panel. As some of you may already know, Iran has been working on different issues of Iran since the establishment in 2016. In this regard, we are the first, and as far as I know, the only independent research center which focuses on a single country in Turkey. We have five research departments as foreign policy, domestic policy, economy, Shia studies, and culture and societal Iran. Apart from our publications in three languages, Turkish, Persian, and English, through our website, we are organizing Persian language classes in different levels, and seminars on Iranian politics, economy, culture, and history regularly. We also hold international conferences each year, like we will have next month, on Chinese, Iranian, and Turkish relations with Yildirim Bayezid University in Ankara. And again, as Iran, we organize lots of panels during the year with variety of subjects on Iran. About today's topic and how we decided to organize this panel, I would say that we have been studying on trade by national currencies for some time and realized that there haven't been academic studies on this matter in Turkey, even though recently several politicians and high-level officials of economies around the world talking about the necessity of it. So we wanted to invite qualified academics and experts from other countries and benefit their experience and knowledge on this issue. And I hope we will have a very fruitful and productive discussion during the next two hours. I don't want to take your time more than that. Just would like to present my special thanks to our guests from different countries and also especially Dr. Hatice Karam, the senior advisor to the Turkish president for participating in our panel and accepting to have opening remarks. Mrs. Karam, please, close yours. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very um, pleased to be here today um, for the panel discussion on trade in national currencies. And I would like to especially thank Iran for inviting me to speak at this very special event. As we all know, over the decades there have been some efforts to undermine the dominance of the well-established currencies and in this context, the use of national currencies in international trade has been a hot topic lately, particularly after the financial global crisis. It has been increasingly realized that local currencies have a considerable potential to promote trade, which is a vital source of economic growth. For this purpose, many countries, including the BRICS countries, uh, even some certain European countries and Iran, have had various attempts to offer alternatives to the ongoing system. And Turkey has also taken this issue on its agenda. As everyone here all knows, President Erdogan frequently highlights the importance of doing trade with our partners, including Russia, China, Iran, and India, through national currencies. He even repeated this call uh, to a number of countries last week at the uh, African Turkey Summit. And in general, this, initiatives, this, this initiative aims at supporting economic uh, relationships by establishing a more stable as well as a more integrated environment for the relevant uh, countries, particularly the developing ones. And based on such efforts, Turkey has experienced an increase in the share of its exports based on Turkish lira from 1% to 8% over the last 10 years. And the target here is to reach 20% in the following five years. 
At this point, the current share of trade in local currencies is obviously not as high as desired, either in Turkey or in most uh, other emerging economies. However, continuing international cooperation, international efforts are quite valuable to materialize the potential here. As an example, the recent cooperation announced among Turkey, Russia, and Iran encourages the prospects in this area. And it's also promising to witness the strong intention of some other big developing countries like India and China to promote the use of local currencies in bilateral economic relations. To be honest, when we take into account the volatile global markets, the uh, monetary policy normalization around the world, and the rising trade protectionism, it becomes increasingly obvious that the developing countries should further cooperate to facilitate trade and hence proceed with necessary steps and actions in this respect. This is needed not only to deal with certain trade deficits and strengthen the ties, but also to contribute to the much needed stability of the emerging market currencies in a world with unpredictable ups and downs. In this framework, there is no doubt that, aside from the opportunities and advantages that I just mentioned, there are certain challenges that have to be faced uh, in order to increase the volume of trade uh, in national currencies. At this point, one main condition that has to be satisfied is providing high accessibility to the currencies of interest and maintaining adequate liquidity in them. This is how the transaction costs would be reasonable in this story. And one other issue that needs to be solved is removing or reducing the inertia stemming from the dominant system to the, uh, so the local currencies can be adopted in a better way. And in this sense, as we all know, the swap agreements signed or to be signed between central banks and the payment systems used significantly matter. A healthy bilateral or even multilateral design in the financial system is definitely required and has to be also accompanied by the encouragement of companies in the private sector for settlements in local currencies. So for all these reasons, I believe that discussing the pros and cons of the matter on an international basis is of critical importance. That is how solutions to the problems, relevant problems can be found to facilitate trade and even to create multilateral collaborations. Therefore, I think the panel to be, uh, to be held here today would definitely serve this purpose. I thank you very much for your attention and time and wish to have a fruitful discussion here today. Thank you. Thank you our event. Uh, my name is Murat Aslan. I am uh, coordinator of uh, economic research at Center for Iranian Studies. I would like to thank uh, for all of you to participate in uh, our event. So I am inviting the presenter to the desk so we can start. As we have known, uh, since the financial crisis, global financial crisis of 2008, we have observed even before then uh, the Asian crisis of 1997 show us that the uh, use of uh, or crisis in one country is easily distributed or contained uh, diffuse other countries in the world and uh, because of financial architecture in uh, the global order cause some uh, uh, undesirable consequences. And uh, we also observed that uh, since uh, last 10 years uh, the world has witnessed uh, finding a new global governance. And one uh, subtopic of this global governance is related to global financial architecture and global financial governance. So today we are going to discuss about one subtopic of this uh, global financial architecture, uh, which is using national currency, because the current uh, US dominating system caused some uh, problems in terms of preventing engaging more trade. Today we invited uh, participants from almost all over the world. Uh, we have uh, a, a professor from India, we are, have expert from Iran, we have expert from Russia, so I am going to, because uh, we have uh, five uh, participants, I don't want to take uh, time. And uh, I want to give uh, words by using my authority in this program as a discrimination manager. I am going to give word to uh, Professor Ilya about uh, her uh, uh, research about uh, using global, uh, uh, using national currency in trade. And particularly, I would like her to share 
the experience of India in terms of using national currency and in what aspect India uh, is successful and in what aspect uh, uh, the impediments that uh, faci uh, in facilitation of uh, using national currency. Okay, the floor is yours. Thank you. transactions for the dollar is even greater. So when people trade, they also want to do derivatives. And that's a very important aspect of uh, uh, the story that I'm going to tell about India as well. Because you know, you're know you buying uh, or selling uh, in a currency where you don't want there to be too much change in value. So you try to hedge your uh, exposure. And that's something that, again, the large dollar derivative transactions uh, in financial markets across the world allow people to do, they don't allow them to do for some of the other currencies. Uh, in the last 10 years, Euro, Yen and Pound have actually lost market share. Uh, and that uh, the Euro particularly, because of all the problems, earlier was on the rise, but then uh, because of the Euro crisis, uh, it has lost uh, even the share that it has initially gained. And there has been some uh, increase in share of the revenue peers. Chinese trade has increased, and this uh, gives us uh, a lot of new challenges. So uh, what we find is that countries with low per capita GDP tend to invoice majority of their trade in common currencies, not in their local currencies, and this being the dollar being the choice of uh, country, uh, or the currency in which almost all low per capita poor countries prefer the dollar. So uh, the, what are the drivers uh, of what makes a country choose a particular currency? I mean, it's trade, because it's a major country, and I'll come back to this story when I talk about India's trade with its small, close, small neighbors where it does become possible then to do trade in the Indian rupee. But uh, primarily, um, it, it's also exchange rate volatility. And if a currency is very volatile, people don't prefer that currency. Again, not something difficult to understand. 
how open the currency is, how whether you can uh, hold assets, hold financial assets in that currency or not, whether you can hold them not just in that country or yours, but in a third place in the world, because these are private players in the market who choose to hold the currency because they are adding to their personal wealth. So that's another very important aspect and historical ties again forms a very important uh, element. Now, uh, most emerging markets have a high share of trade with the US and the EU and low EM to EM trade is actually quite low. Within Asia also we find so, uh, when I come to India, we, if we look at South Asian trade, it's actually very low, which uh, we're not trading with Bangladesh and Pakistan and Sri Lanka as much as we're trading with others. So there's low EM trade, there is low regional trade, and again, that's something which I think is uh, should come back to this discussion uh, and should come back to the countries around the table, that what is the share of trade that we do with each other before we can think of which currencies we use to do the trade in. Uh, there are, uh, in emerging economies often have higher inflation compared to advanced countries, though we have moved to an inflation targeting central bank, but still our levels of inflation also remain higher and therefore the currency is more likely to depreciate and therefore less likely to be an attractive asset. We also have low levels of financial sector openness, we put restrictions, uh, and this is true not just for India, but for most other emerging economies, and particularly poor economies, that we put restrictions on uh, what is the amount of, uh, uh, what are the assets that can be held by foreigners in the country. What are the Indian assets that can be held or what are the local assets that can be held. So, you know, local current holding cash as an asset is obviously uh, something that is at one use and the rest is having other assets, real estate, shares, uh, companies and so on. So, how open is our capital account? I would now turn to the uh, volume of the BRICS currency since uh, uh, most of us are around the table and how uh, they have been traded in international markets. This data is from the Bank of International Settlements, so it's like two years old because they do a triennial survey. Every three years they do a survey of uh, the trade and um, turnover and invoicing of currencies. So as you can see, uh, while the Chinese uh, renminbi has shot up, the others are still uh, languishing uh, way behind. Uh, there have been uh, similarities in the evolution of BRICS currencies. So they've grown, like, uh, again, I'm leaving China out because as you saw in the graph, that went way ahead. But the others have grown at an average of about 20% between 2001 and uh, 2010 and the levels of trading in BRICS currencies have also been similar. Uh, I think Russia has gained more in these last two years compared to the others, but uh, uh, it hasn't come out in the BIS data uh, yet. And uh, in 2016, uh, the sum of the average daily turnover uh, in the BRICS currencies was roughly equal to half the turnover in the remnant so it is the remnant that uh, came, but the others did not. Now, let's take the example of China before I go to India. I thought that would be something that is of interest because of the very large trade that uh, China does. Uh, it has been some successful to some extent in increasing payments and invoicing in uh, RMB. It has also become part of the SDR basket, so some countries are holding uh, the, the renminbi in their official uh, reserves. Uh, about 40 countries uh, have reported to the COFR database of the IMF that they are holding uh, renminbi in their official reserves. And uh, it, China does fulfill the condition of being a large uh, trading partner. Uh, it is a major investor in several uh, countries. And what we find is that it's really those countries in which either China is a very, very large trading partner or uh, those where it has large investments and hence political influence, which have started 
uh, invoicing or trading in the revenue. So that's part of the uh, story. But uh, still, because it is financially closed, so it is not that the adoption of uh, revenue B is as large as one might have uh, expected it to be. So what I have here is uh, different snapshots over a period of time of which currencies are being used uh, for payments. Uh, and the big four uh, remain uh, dominant throughout. And nobody has really been able to come up above uh, the uh, euro, uh, the dollar, euro, yen, and pound. Despite China becoming much bigger as a trading partner than, say, the UK, but still the pound has stayed there. And as the graph shows, it's gone between uh, the uh, fourth and fifth position. Uh, let me now turn to India. Uh, this uh, use of local currency is something that India has been trying, and I thought it might be pertinent to share some of our experiences uh, and what we have been trying, what are the challenges, and why we have perhaps not succeeded as much as we might have uh, liked to. Uh, there has been an increase in the trading volume of the rupee, so both uh, the spot and uh, derivatives markets, onshore and offshore markets, and I have a little bit of data to show that there has actually been quite a large increase, uh, which one would have thought would hopefully reflect in people being able to use the rupee for trade and for invoicing. Uh, now, uh, we are going to use um, the BIS data because that's pretty much uh, what we have comp uh, comparable across countries, though I would like to add that as a caveat that there might be underreporting in the BIS data because they hold one survey, I think, in April, and there, that might be a time uh, when not everybody is using, so there might be seasonality. And uh, there might be uh, other reasons for underreporting. Some people have made estimates and, and said that actually uh, the actual amount of uh, rupee trading that's happening is much bigger than what we see here. Uh, this is uh, from the BIS data that is still showing that the average daily turnover in the rupee has increased sharply since 1995. Uh, the rupee has been uh, <coughs> virtually on the trade account since 1995, 93, 94. So. 95 is the relevant date. Now, yeah, uh, one uh, part of the story is also, so there are two parts of the story. One is how much do private, uh, how much does the private sector use the rupee? And the other is how much does the official sector use the rupee? So for the official sector, it is easy to get data. Uh, official sector means government, central banks holding the rupee. There is very limited, uh, holding of the rupee. So there are about six countries that hold the INR to the tune of about a billion uh, USD. And um, that's what they report in their uh, copper database. So we have Nepal, we have Bhutan, you know, some of our neighbors with whom our central bank has uh, direct agreements that they can hold uh, reserves in rupees. So those are the ones that are holding them. And there is some anecdotal evidence that the rupee is accepted in Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, UK. But you know, in UK, I mean, you use the pound. It's you know, one main, in some shops in East London, so, you know, South Falls, where you might be able to use it, but not really that. So this is just very, very little use. Uh, historically, actually, in the Indian rupee used to be legal tender uh, right up till the 50s in many countries like Qatar, Bahrain, UAE, Kuwait, Oman, and uh, even uh, Malaysia till the mid-60s, where you officially could use the uh, rupee, because then the rupee was more convertible. You've gone back on that. Uh, now, second, I turn to the private sector, uh, which is really the big, biggest, hopefully the biggest story. And um, one, uh, the first uh, chart shows you debt uh, in rupees. So uh, there are masala bonds, we call them masala bonds, that is rupee denominated uh, uh, foreign borrowing uh, by Indian companies. So Indian companies can borrow abroad, not just in dollar denominated debt, but in rupee denominated debt. And there's a bit of that. Yeah, India has about uh, 2 billion and China has about 50 billion. So again, 
there is a little bit of that. We put restrictions on that. So they have to get permissions from the central bank, which is the Reserve Bank of India, to be able to offer masala bonds. Uh, second uh, graph shows you the invoicing of exports. Now, as you can see, it's primarily the dollar. So the last uh, 88.4, I don't have a pointer, but basically if you look at the uh, US dollar uh, that dominates the export invoicing of exports from India, and that uh, remains uh, uh, more or less uh, dominant till today, maybe around 80 today, and not uh, 88 as in 2012 30. Uh, the third chart uh, table below shows the invoicing of imports, and again, it is uh, the dollar which is uh, so. When we buy things from people, we would prefer that we get in dollars, and that the invoicing is in dollars. So, even if there is currency fluctuation, uh, the trade happens in dollars. All other currencies, as you can see in both charts, is about uh, roughly 2 to 2.6 uh, in 2012 13. This has risen a little bit in the last uh, few years. So, putting together a picture of the official use of the rupee as well as the private use of the rupee, uh, one has just tried to summarize here and basically, as an international currency, the rupee performs poorly. Uh, International reserves are negligible for foreign currency intervention. Nobody uses the rupee. Uh, surprisingly, not even Bhutan does, whereas they are pegged to the rupee. Nepal doesn't do it. They are pegged to the rupee. They use dollars. Uh, uh, as an anchor for local currency pegging, uh, well, Bhutan has, but uh, nobody else. Bhutan and Nepal have, but nobody else has. Uh, we do allow some. Um, we, we, we do allow uh, foreigners to invest in stock market, so there is a bit of that and that is being used. But denominating trade and financial transactions in the rupee across the world has remained uh, negligible. Now, what does this mean for international trade? The Indian government has promoted bilateral invoicing and settlement in local currencies since 2012. Uh, in spite of it being proposed, it has uh, uh, only Bhutan and Nepal have access. For all other currencies, uh, the noti latest notification, which I'll show issued by the RBI, uh, says trade from and to India may be invoiced in freely convertible currencies or rupees. So not in the lira. Right. And that's, since I'm here, I may point that out. So in freely convertible currencies, and that's part of the framework. Uh, now, one can have bilateral deals which allow a workaround, around work around this notification. But then, you know, those decisions have to be taken at a high level of government to have those bilateral deals uh, with involvement of the central banks of both countries. Now, uh, there has been an increase. Uh, in, the BIS estimates uh, represent a lower bound because uh, they don't account for derivatives transactions. But uh, if I uh, look at, um, there's still been, you know, a lot of increase in derivatives transactions, particularly offshore derivatives transactions of the rupee. So these have, uh, to some extent, helped in more in terms of foreigners wanting to hedge uh, their returns uh, from the investments that they make, particularly in debt and equity markets, in financial markets. Not, uh, and to some extent, uh, to uh, their, the trade, uh, because they do are able to hedge their uh, uh, exposure to the rupee. But it remains mainly INRUSD. So all the, the, the derivatives are all focused on the uh, dollar. So it's the rupee dollar rate for which you can buy a, a future or a forward. So that's that remains the focus. Uh, as I said, uh, only now 44% of the uh, currency trading of the rupee is in India. A lot of this, and particularly derivatives, is offshore. So one might have thought, I mean, I, I'm saying that despite all that, which might have led one to think that, yes, it is possible for people to move to the rupee. But that's uh, something that's still not uh, happening. Uh, let me not go into the location question, because it's, again, really the same thing that one would 
hope that currency internationalization and the fact that it is being uh, bought and sold and derivatives are being bought and sold outside the country, outside the country would uh, make uh, it far more used than it is uh, being used. And there is uh, enough evidence to suggest that a lot of that offshoring has been happening for the European. Uh, but unfortunately, that does not reflect in uh, trade invoicing. That does not reflect in trade in the rupee. So what I have in this graph is showing you, uh, you can maybe even barely see the Indian rupee there. It's, uh, and the lira rupee are pretty much sitting next to each other. And the Russian ruble is maybe just a little bit more. The Chinese ruble will be a bit more, but it's primarily a dollar denominated um, uh, invoicing um, world um, as we continue to live in it. There are uh, a couple of studies that argue that uh, uh, what really explains this uh, domination of the dollar is the fact that you have derivatives available in dollars. That it is the availability of uh, say for us, the INR USD, uh, six months, three months, which allows us to think about uh, uh, going for the USD because otherwise uh, one is not sure of the value that one is receiving, one is not sure of the value that one is paying. So it is the ability to hedge. And, and these are a couple of studies that I have uh, cited here which uh, suggest that it is the uh, primary hedging costs, so the uh, availability of hedging and the costs of hedging are the primary driver of the, which currency do you uh, use. Now, uh, as I said there, uh, Indian government has promoted bilateral invoicing. So this is a circular which really forms the uh, legal, the, the regulation, the basis of uh, what India has been trying to do. It says that to provide the facility to settle payments in home currency on a bilateral basis for current account transactions, settlement between India and trading partner countries. Uh, it tries to promote the use of participants' currencies and current account transactions between their respective countries, to promote cooperation among the participants and closer relations among the banking systems in the two countries and thereby contribute to expansion of trade and economic activity between the two countries. Uh, the exporters and sellers of each country shall denominate the export contracts and invoices in their home currency thereby eliminating exchange risk and resultingly, resultantly may discover competitive pricing. Uh, there are bilateral deals with Iran and Russia and some, to some extent with China uh, through uh, Indian uh, banks. Uh, now, according to some data which is not publicly available, which is from the SWIFT, uh, where, where, where in, which is used by banking systems to do forex transactions, 80% uh, of the trade, as I've uh, said earlier, was settled in the USD, followed by 7.2% in INR, and which was mainly in Nepal and Bhutan, 6.3% uh, in Euro, and the remaining 65 uh, split in all other currencies. And this percentage share indicates uh, approximately 50 to 70 billion uh, dollars of trade uh, that is settled in uh, rupees. The amount that gets settled in rupees is this much. But it, the rupee has not entered the list of the top 20 currencies. Now, uh, just to spend my last one minute, one minute and four seconds that I have, on uh, the challenges for local currency trade. Uh, if people are not going to be able to use the currency for other things, if they're not going to be able to buy assets with it, it's not going to serve as a store of value, so they don't want to put that currency. At the end of the day, however much the government facilitates it, it is exporters and importers who have to feel comfortable that, yes, they can 
take this money, they can, it won't change in its value, they'll be able to buy things with it, they'll be able to buy assets, so well, and people don't want to just use everything that very day, so it's, you know, or that very year, so it's about it as a store of wealth. Now, we have been very reluctant in making uh, the rupee convertible. We have huge capital controls, and I, that's part of the reason why even with our trading partners, uh, because we put restrictions on what they can do with the rupees that they will earn, they can't buy assets easily. So there are restrictions, and our main lesson is that unless we free up that, and then as long as our currency is non-convertible, it's not an international currency, there will be challenges in trying to do what we are trying to achieve here. An international currency is one in which can be used and held beyond the borders of the issuing currency and includes transactions which can be done involving only non-residents. So it should not need an Indian on one side, it need not be on Indian soil. And I think our reluctance to move forward on that is today one of the biggest challenges that we've created. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ida Pradeek. Uh, as I told you at the beginning of my speech, the contagion is one of the most important problems regarding uh, dollar domination in uh, global financial architecture. And another important issue is about economic sanctions. Uh, all the participants in the desk is facing with the sanction by the United States. It is unfortunate that uh, the power of the United States in dominating uh, the global financial system is sometimes give the uh, United States in incredible leverage in using these financial uh, tools to serve its uh, political purposes. That is why uh, uh, participants from Iran, Russia, even India uh, and Turkey uh, has experienced uh, U.S. sanction. That is why one of the reasons that we are using uh, this uh, using national currency is bypassing uh, U.S. sanction. And uh, today, uh, although uh, the President Recep Tayyip Erdogan frequently brings this issue uh, and promote uh, using national currency in foreign trade, but there are two actors in the state side. It is okay, but in the private sector, generally they choose uh, on the basis of cost and benefit of those transactions. That is why uh, you, some European countries, although politically they support uh, nuclear deal with Iran, but unfortunately we observe that private sector actors generally hesitate to engage uh, trade with Iran because of this uh, pressure from uh, uh, American sanctions. Again, uh, we have a, a, a guest uh, from Turkish uh, Business uh, Association, MÜSİAD, which is one of the biggest uh, trade association in Turkey. So, uh, in polit there is a political uh, will, but on the opposite side, the uh, people coming from the real side of the issue, uh, people who really engage trade on the field, uh, are the those uh, practicing uh, trade activity uh, and uh, the feeling of businessmen is uh, becoming important. That is why I would like to listen uh, what the businessmen think about uh, using national currency uh, and I am leaving floor to uh, Mr. Ilhan Erdal from uh, MÜSİAD. <coughs> Evet, ben de İran'a öncelikle böyle bir günde böyle önemli bir konuyu ele aldığı için çok teşekkür ediyorum. Kıymetli misafirlere, hanımefendilere, beyefendilere de hoş geldiniz, sefalar getirdiniz diyoruz. Acaba parayı bulan Libyalılar bugünleri görseler neler derlerdi diye bir soruyla konuya başlamak istiyorum. Paranın araç değil de amaç edinildiği, insanların parayı bir yatırım aracı olarak kullandığı bugünlerde e, bugünleri görerek parayı e, bugüne getirildiği bir dönemin nasıl yönetildiğini görseler acaba neler düşünürdü? E, ben de bunu merak ediyorum. 
paranın bir yatırım aracı olarak özellikle bize ait olmayan bir paranın yatırım aracı olarak kullanılmasının ülkemize verdiği tahribatı ve sıkıntıları hep beraber gördük. Biz İş Adamları Derneği olarak böyle önemli süreçlerde dalgalanan bu döviz kurlarının açtığı tahribatı ve sıkıntıları en iyi yaşayanlardan ve bilenlerden biriyiz. Özellikle bu konularda son dönemlerde ciddi manada ülkemizdeki oluşan sıkıntıları hep beraber yaşıyoruz. Ve bunun üstesinden geleceğimize de inanıyoruz. Ben Sayın Cumhurbaşkanımıza yerli para kullanımıyla alakalı başlattığı süreçle ilgili sizlerin huzurunda da iş adamı olarak teşekkür etmek istiyorum. Çok kıymetli akademisyenler burada önemli bilgiler verecekler. Az önce moderatörümüzün de söylediği gibi biz reel sektörde neler yaşıyoruz, ne sıkıntılar yaşıyoruz ve beklentilerimizin ne olduğunu kısaca sizinle paylaşmak istiyorum. Bu paylaşmamın içine de yerli para biriminin ehemmiyetini, önemini bir yatırımcı olarak yaşadığım sıkıntılardan örnek vererek de sizinle paylaşmayı tercih edeceğim. Az önce külliyeden çok kıymetli hocamız Hatice Hanım'la yukarıda da birkaç konuyu ele aldık. Biz Türkiye Cumhuriyeti'nde yaşıyoruz. Bizim yerli ve milli bir paramız var. Ama yerli ve milli bir paramız varken biz yurt dışından kaynak bularak bir takım şeyleri yurt dışı kaynakları veya döviz bazındaki para biriminde yapmayı tercih ettik. Belki süreç bizi bu noktaya itti. Bu yöntemi tercih etmenin bu dalgalı kurla ne kadar yanlış olduğunu görenlerden bir tanesi. Ben şu anda bir yatırımcı olarak Ankara'da çok önemli bir AVM inşa etmiş ve Euro bazında kredi kullanmış bir yatırımcıyım. Bu dalgalı kurla beraber bu Euro'nun bize geri dönüş maliyetinin ne kadar uzun bir süre olacağını yaşayanlardan bir tanesi. Neden biz böyle bir şeyi tercih ettik? Bugün sorguluyorum. Neden yerli bir para birimimiz varken bize ait olmayan bir para birimiyle borçlandık. Kullandığımız ürünlerin birçoğu yerli ve milli ürünler. TL ile alabileceğimiz ürünler. Yurt dışından da bu türlü karşılıklı ticaret yapacağımız ürünleri de yerli para birimiyle yapma şansımız varken bunların birçoğunu da yine bize ait olmayan para birimleriyle yapıyoruz. Ben Aynı zamanda değil, Endonezya İş Konseyi Başkanıyım. İçimizde yine müsiyattan birçok arkadaşımız iş konseylerin başkanlığını yapıyor. Özellikle yerli para birimini konuşurken aynı zamanda İran ve yanımızda birçok komşu ülkelerimiz veya Asya Pasifik uzak ülkelerde de birçok Müslüman ülkelerle Karşılıklı ticari ticaretlerimizin ne kadar düşük olduğunu, bu yerli para birimiyle beraber onlarla çok kolay ticaret yapabilme imkanımız varken birbirimizi tercih etmememizin sebeplerini de aslında konuşmamız gerekiyor. Yerli para birimiyle ilgili hem Türkiye'de hem yurt dışında ticaretin yapılmasını konuşurken bunların da ele alınıp Bunların da bir gündem yapılması bana göre çok önemli. Ben bu özellikle İran'la veya dediğim gibi başka ülkelerle yapılacak yerli para birimiyle alakalı ticaretin çok önemli olduğunu ve bugün önemli önemli olan bir gündemde bunun ele alınmasını gerçekten çok önemsediğimi bir kere daha ifade etmek istiyorum. Şu anda hepimizin gözü televizyonlardaki döviz kurlarının aşağıya ya da yukarıya doğru 
yönelişini takip etmeyle geçiyor. Ve ben bir iş adamı olarak bir şeyi daha ifade etmek istiyorum. Şu anda döviz kuruyla bu dalgalı kurdan kaynaklanan nedenlerden dolayı şu anda yatırım yapacak insanlar teklif almakta zorlanıyor. Fiyat almakta zorlanıyor. Yerli para birimi karşılığında. Yani bir emtiyayı döviz ithal edilen bir emtianın yerli para birimi TL bazında fiyatını almakta şu anda zorlanıyoruz. Bunlar hepsi reel sektör olarak yaşadığımız problemler. Bunların her birini bizim aşmamız gerekiyor. Bunları aşabilmemiz için en önemli konulardan bir tanesi tabii ki yerli ve milli ürünlerin üretilmesi, ithalatın azaltılması. İthalatı biz ne kadar azaltırsak yerli para birimiyle yapacağımız ticareti de o oranda yükseltmiş olacağız. Ya da ihracat yaptığımızda komşu ülkelerimizle karşılıklı ticaretimizde yerli para birimleriyle yapma kolaylığını yaşayacağız. Ben bunu üretirken bunun ara girdilerinin çoğunun ithal olduğu bir yerde ben bunu yerli para birimiyle bir komşu ülkeye satıp yerli para birimiyle ticaret yapma şansını bulamam. Çünkü benim ithal ettiğim ürünün karşılığında bir de ödeme yapmam gerekiyor. Gibi birçok bunların sıkıntıları var. Bunu özellikle Cumhurbaşkanımızın gündeme getirmesi, insanların kolaycılıktan kaçarak bu zorlukla bu problemleri aşmamızın gerektiğini ve aşabileceğimize inananlardan bir tanesi. 11 bin üyesi olan 1 milyon 600 bin çalışanı 45 bin işletmeyi temsil eden dev bir sivil toplum örgütünün Ankara Başkanı. Dolayısıyla bu meseleyi bütün sivil toplum örgütleri iş alemi sahiplendiğinde kolaycılıktan kaçtığında bu işi başarmamızın çok kolay olacağına inananlardan. Özellikle bu yurt dışındaki hepinizin bildiği son dönemlerde yaşadığımız Amerika Birleşik Devletleri ile alakalı bir süreç geçirdik. Siyasi olan bir takım şeyler parasal dalgalanmaların verdiği sıkıntılardan dolayı iş alemini çok ciddi manada sıkıntıya soktu. Çok şükür e, bu konuyla alakalı gerek hazinenin, gerek e, siyasi iradenin gösterdiği bir takım çabalar neticesinde kur bir seviyeye geldi ve o sıkıntıları bertaraf ettik. Ama yerli parayla bir takım şeyleri yapmış olsaydık bugün bu sıkıntıların birçoğunu yaşamamış olacak idik. Az önce çok kıymetli hanımefendinin de bahsettiği gibi bizi bugünlerde bir takım sıkıntılar dediğim gibi yaşadık ama gelecekle alakalı da ben bir gündemi daha burada özellikle e, duyurmak istiyorum. Çin'in başlattığı bir kuşak bir yol projesi var. Bu bir kuşak bir yol projesiyle beraber Çin'den başlayarak ta Avrupa'ya kadar devam edecek İpek yolu veya Afrika ülkelerindeki yapılanmaları ve altyapı çalışmalarıyla beraber Türkiye'nin buna karşılık bir pozisyon alması gerektiğini düşünenlerden ve bununla alakalı çok ciddi manada da bir takım araştırmalarımız var. Özellikle bu süreçte hem Çin'le karşılıklı yerli para birimiyle ticaretin, Hindistan'la yerli para birimiyle alakalı ticaretin, komşu ülkelerimizle ticaretin bir politika ve bir strateji olarak zaten şu anda gündemimizde bunların yakın takip edilerek e, önümüzdeki günlere hazırlık yapılması gerektiğini düşünüyorum. Geçenlerde Fransa Başkanı'nın e, Cumhurbaşkanı çok önemli bir söylemi vardı. Eğer Avrupa olarak gelecekteki 
süreci takip etmezsek gelecekte büyük devletler ve büyük şirketler bizi yönetecek duruma gelecek söylemini e, ve Amerika Birleşik Devletleri'nin şu anda Çin'le ticari savaşlarını çok iyi okumamız gerekiyor. Buna karşılıkta Türkiye Cumhuriyeti olarak hazırlıklı e, olmamız gerektiğini düşünüyorum. Ben şimdilik e, sizlere teşekkür etmek istiyorum. We would like to thank Ilhan uh, Erdal uh, for his uh, valuable contribution. And uh, as we also living in a transition period uh, where the economic gravity of world is uh, moving from west to east and he rightly uh, emphasized this point, we observe that uh, Chinese economic performance has been about eight, nine percent since uh, early 1980s. And also, India uh, economic growth is also brilliant uh, for uh, almost uh, 20 years. So it is clear that uh, the economic gravity is moving to Asia, and we also observe this uh, Belt and Road Initiative is going to play a significant role in not only in the financial sphere of the world, but also in global and geopolitics. And therefore, uh, Turkey should prepare itself to this uh, new developments uh, in the global order. And uh, giving this uh, background information, uh, I am going to uh, give uh, the floor uh, to the uh, Russian side. And uh, we have a very uh, brilliant economist from uh, Russia, Marcel Salikov. Uh, he is coming from Moscow. And he is going to talk about, uh, again, uh, the importance of US sanction and how Russian respond and uh, how uh, using national currency uh, is influencing Russian trade and how Russia is using those tools to prevent itself from uh, this instability in uh, uh, global order. Okay, floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for inviting. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And I will talk about uh, the Russian experience and the challenges and opportunities that we are facing currently. Uh, so, the structure of my talk will be as follows. So, first of all, I will just give just a brief, uh, some kind of background information on the Russian economy, as I believe that the structure of the economy and the factors that are influencing uh, have a great impact on the trade in national currency. So there should be a fit between the economy and the, the uh, question about the trade in national currencies. And then I will talk about uh, the experience that we already have and that, uh, the success that we have and the problems that we're facing. And then I will try uh, to uh, come to some conclusions uh, based also on some global constraints that Professor Iva already talked about. Uh, so, Russian economy. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, so, just j just a few words. Uh, so, Russia is still mostly about commodities. As 80% of total Russian exports are oil and gas and metals and chemicals. So, uh, in the last 10-15 uh, years, the government tried uh, to diversify to stimulate uh, high-tech industries, manufacturing, manufacturing industries. But as we can conclude, there were some successes, but still they are very modest. And so it's mostly about the commodities. And the problem is, as uh, commodities are priced in USD, uh, it's very hard to change that, because exporters that export all those commodities, they more, much more prefer to get US dollars than some other countries because there is a global benchmark in USD. Uh, and another thing is that uh, we have, as we have large exports, uh, Russia has a large current uh, and uh, trade positive balance. So that means that we, in general, receive more effects than we spend. And for the trade in national currencies, it's better to have more balanced trade because otherwise you have some kind of a spare cash that results in. And if you have, a, if if you do not have any opportunities like to invest in some financial assets, you do not have really know what to do with 
uh, this uh, currency. So another thing important is obviously sanctions. As since 2014, uh, as uh, the situation in Ukraine deteriorated, uh, the US and the European Union imposed a number of sanctions. And as you see on the chart, there are a huge uh, number of individuals and a number of companies that are in the sanction list. And uh, the most recently they were, uh, in April of this year, the US expanded uh, the use of sanctions and included a number of uh, private companies. So the most important story was that Rusal, which is a major aluminium producer, was included in the sanctions. So it was put in SDN list, which means that for uh, at least for US people and US companies, any transaction with this company are forbidden and will be blocked by the American banks. So uh, I will talk about later about this story, but this was kind of an, a story that put a lot of other companies uh, to the situation that there is a huge risk that any transaction or any of your contracts that are currently priced in US dollars may be blocked. Or well, for example, if you have uh, some kind of a euro bond uh, in US dollars and you have to make a payment, you cannot make those payments even if you have the money. So that's a problem uh, for any large corporation in Russia and that's why many of them are trying uh, to kind of do something about that. Uh, so, about uh, training partners, uh, still uh, you're, with all those you know, tr problems and with sanctions, still uh, European Union is Russia's main trading partner. The share of EU declined uh, in the last 10 years and it was taking place even before uh, the sanctions going on. Uh, but still we trade mostly within the European Union. Uh, in the last years, the share of China grown significantly as Russia started to export a large amount of uh, oil and we still buy a lot of consumer and investment goods from China. So China is currently uh, the second largest trading partner for, for Russia. And uh, another important story is that Russia has a, a trading bloc called Eurasian Economic Union which consists of Armenia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, uh, and Kyrgyzstan. So there is a kind of free trade agreement, and there is an ongoing integration moving to a common labor market and a common regulation in different spheres. So it's a kind of regional trading bloc that helped to facilitate uh, trade in, uh, in uh, rules. Uh, so another point I wanted to make is that for uh, to simulate trade in national currency, uh, economic policy and the quality of the economic policy matters a lot. So uh, I think that there are now some kind of no silver bullet or some kind of trick in order to stimulate people to trade in national currency. If there should be some kind of solid foundation, and the solid foundation is the economic policy. So even with, there are, in the last five years, there were huge shocks uh, for Russian economy because of the oil prices going down, because of the sanctions, but still, uh, from my personal opinion, uh, the policy in Russia was pretty much okay. So uh, we moved to free floating FX regime, uh, in 2014, and then we moved to inflation targeting regime uh, by central bank in 2015. Uh, so uh, it's as the upper chart shows, it's the share of FX deposits by households and uh, by corporation. So when there was an economic recession of 2008, 2009, there was a huge spike in dollar deposits because people moved away from the national currencies. Uh, to FX. And in the last uh, uh, five years, there were some shifts because of the recession to FX deposit, but the, the sensitivity of people and the companies were much lower. And it's because mainly uh, because of the you know, central bank moving to uh, inflation targeting and uh, holding rather tight monetary policy. So. Uh, currently, Russian Central Bank aims at 2-3% uh, 
uh, positive frill rates. And that means that even if you hold uh, your savings in the rubles, you can uh, expect to earn some real interest uh, money. So that's why uh, you know people, at least some level of trust is improved in the last ten years, and that helped uh, to to kind of to stabilize and to help uh, the economy to adapt to external shocks. And another thing is that uh, fiscal policy is also pretty much okay, as uh, we have a fiscal rule which actually which essentially limits uh, the level of the government expenditures. It's based on so-called base oil price, which currently is forty-two dollars per barrel, which means that there are conservative assumptions for the fiscal policy, and uh, we try even with uh, oil prices going up and. Uh, oil uh, government revenues going up, still not to, you know, in such a volatile and uncertain environment, not to increase uh, the uh, government expenditures. Because if, if it's go down, there will be a, a problem. So my point is that uh, you have kind of, in order to uh, build a trust of uh, the economic agents, you have to kind of have a quali quality fiscal and monetary policy that builds a foundation to promote the use of your own currency in uh, foreign trade. Uh, so a little bit of our current status and about the experience that we have in, in the last 10 years with stimulating uh, foreign trade in national currencies. So currently uh, uh, there were uh, uh, like ruble is used in 30% of export payments and it's 9% uh, per, uh, in EU and 6.4% uh, uh, for China uh, the transactions and it's used in 31% in, of import transactions by value. So you can see that uh, there are some kind of successes in that sphere and uh, but uh, in the last years, uh, not, it doesn't truly really improve. Probably because of these sanctions uh, accelerating, it's really hard to persuade people, uh, you know, to uh, make uh, payments and make transactions in the problems. As you know, it's it, it, it's obviously a risky thing for any foreign counterparty to do. And uh, we had implemented as. Uh, Russia started uh, to think and uh, to you know to stimulate use of uh, uh, national currency in the last you know, 10 years. We have some experience and we have some policy uh, measures and uh, instruments that uh, specifically were aimed at stimulating it. So one of the thing is that uh, it's it helps that if you have some strong economic integration with your neighboring uh, countries and like. The Eurasian Union is uh, kind of one of the biggest stories for Russia where uh, ruble dominates the trade with Russia. Currently it's about uh, from 70 to 80 percent of uh, Russian trade with Eurasian Union uh, countries is made in uh, rubles. So that means that if you have an integration with some kind of small economies with less developed financial markets, uh, uh, it helps to use your own currency with the trade with them. Uh, then uh, we have uh, a special kind of financing instruments and bodies that stimulate specifically the trade in national currencies. So, for example, if you have an export import agency, or uh, you have an active uh, national development bank, or you have a special programs for your local bank to provide trade financing in rubles. It helps to facilitate trade in, in local currencies. And another important uh, thing is that uh, you have to organize uh, some kind of direct effects trade in, uh, in, in cross currencies. So in, in Russia, it's the most active and the most kind of liquid instrument is uh, the trade in yuan rubble, which was organized uh, in 2013. And it was quite successful. In last year, the uh, total turnover of the spot market was around six billion US dollars. So it means uh, that it's uh, not very liquid, but it's fairly liquid uh, instrument. 
and uh, if you uh, a Russian company, you can actually buy uh, a Chinese yuan on the Moscow exchange. You have some also uh, instruments for hedging in that. So that means that you. Uh, one of the problem is that uh, if if cross currency pairs are not very liquid and there are no kind of hedging instruments, then there is no point of the local companies to trade in that currency. So uh, currently there are discussions of expanding this uh, on Moscow exchange and to add some more currencies. Currently there are just Belarusian ruble and uh, Chinese yuan. And another thing, as I mentioned, is uh, uh, commodities matter a lot for, uh, for Russian economy. We try to kind of organize some kind of uh, commodity trade in, in on, uh, local uh, places. Like uh, we have a local commodity exchange in St. Petersburg called Spimax, which organizes uh, commodity trade for the domestic market, but also uh, tries to organize the sale of euros crude uh, in, in kind of in St. Petersburg. So there is, uh, last year it was organized, uh, you, you can actually buy uh, physical oil on the spot market in St. Petersburg and uh, you can also uh, trade futures on Urals in St. Petersburg. Currently uh, the volumes of those trades are fairly small, but I think that it's uh, the step in the right direction as uh, there should be some instruments uh, to buy Russian commodities uh, on kind of local exchanges and potentially uh, you should have an opportunity, for example, if you are in some kind of foreign company, to buy it also in uh, Russian currency. Uh, yes, yeah, so I would uh, wanted to uh, to talk about more about the Eurasian Union as it's kind of uh, the relative success story of Russian kind of story of uh, use of national currencies. So currently, as I've said, about 80% of the payments between Russia and EU countries are made in uh, rubles. But the problem is, for example, is that in trade of Eurasian Union countries between each other, excluding uh, Russia, for example, the trade between Kazakhstan and Kazakhstan, it is still mostly made in US dollars. So companies in those countries, when they transact with each other, they use, prefer to use US dollars, but not, for example, to use their local currencies or to use Russian ruble. So it's one of the kind of difficulties, even if it's highly dominated by Russian ruble and by Russian economy still, there are some problems. And actually, there was a survey uh, of uh, businessmen uh, when they kind of asked the people why do they uh, choose one currency or another, and one, what are the problems of uh, kind of using national currencies? And what the people said is uh, the kind of the largest problems are uh, low liquidity of uh, FX cross pairs, like. If you cannot buy or trade local currency directly. You have to use some kind of vehicle currency as US dollar or euro still. And if it's liquidity low and if there are no hedging instruments or they're not really liquid, so if you cannot actually trade fairly large amount, then kind of it, it costs a lot uh, for, for the business to make transactions in those currencies. Uh, uh, so, and another thing is like, uh, in most uh, cases, the trade financing in uh, local currencies is much more expensive than you use uh, to organize financing from banks in uh, dollars or in euros is much cheaper than to organize trade financing in the local currency. So that's one kind of the, the what uh, people tell and what business says. What are the kind of impediments for the use of the national currencies in uh, trans uh, in um, in foreign trade? And another point I wanted to mention is that uh, trade is one part of the story, but another part of the story is kind of investments because uh, investments uh, it's one of the biggest 
factors that drive trade between the countries. So if there are investments from, uh, and uh, uh, Russian experience with the Eurasian Union showed that if you invest in those countries, if you have large investment projects, then uh, it helps to facilitate trade in euro own currency. Because people still, uh, there are lots of you know, economic links like financing, like trade, like people moving in, in and out. So it's kind of one of the long-term drivers uh, for the trade as well. Uh, um, yeah, and uh, just a few words about the current discussion in Russia, because probably you've heard about uh, the plan, so it's so-called plan for de-dollarization, which was presented by um, Andrei Kostin, which is head of VTB Bank, the second largest bank in Russia, to uh, President Putin. And there are lots of talks about uh, it in Russia, and I would stress out what can be the unintended consequences uh, of such kind of de-dollarization plan. So if you look at the plan, uh, it's really nothing that much serious. So it's not that Russia will kind of convert FX deposits uh, <coughs> on some predetermined FX rate or things like that. It's just, you know, just general uh, kind of steps uh, because of the sanctions, we kind of will try to move the legal addresses of Russian corporations in national jurisdiction, we try to simulate uh, current, uh, trade in other currencies rather than US dollars because there are risks of uh, blocking uh, by the um, US and uh, things like that. But uh, the kind of the outcome of those talks is that uh, people started uh, to take away for, for FX deposits from Russian banks and it led to capital outflow in the last month. So just the talk of such a thing, even if it's nothing serious is planned and is kind of uh, will be implemented, kind of still there is kind of a fear of individuals and the companies that government tries you know, to seize our assets, to seize our deposits. Maybe you know we we should move away uh, to some foreign banks or you know move away from the state banks and so you have to kind of think about the consequences that such uh, kind of uh, plans for, uh, or can be on, you know, on the behavior of the private agents. Uh, and so to continue with that, uh, it's, there are, as with many other topics in economics and finance, there are obvious costs and benefits with any issue. So like uh, trade in national currencies has some benefits uh, for uh, the local economies and it helps to facilitate trade to some extent. It will help, you know, to if there is a demand uh, for your uh, currency, it helps uh, to kind of to lower inflation and to stabilize uh, the currency. But still, there are obvious risks uh, why uh, you know use of uh, your currency in trade or in reserve can be harmful. And so, as experience of other countries show, they still, uh, there are talks about use of national currencies, but, but there are still very strong uh, restrictions of what you can do with uh, the currency. And that's why it's still kind of, there is a contradiction between those two goals. So if you are really serious about moving uh, towards the increased internalization of your own currency, you have to understand the risks that are involved in that story. So it's not just you know one way. It's it's kind of complicated thing. Uh, yeah. So uh, if I have more time, oh, three, oh no, okay. I'll just keep. We uh, kind of the. Uh, I just relax. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I would, uh, you know, wanted to talk about as we uh, in um, Center for Iranian Studies about the so-called Russia-Iran uh, deal, uh, oil for goods, which was organized in the last years, and it was kind of I don't know whether how it was perceived in Iran, but at least in Russia it was kind of 
the biggest stories that we, we will make a trade with Iran and we will try to, you know, to help each other and things like that. And what the deal was is that uh, Russia agrees to buy 5 million tons of oil from Iran. It's about uh, $100,000 barrels per day. And uh, Iran will buy half of uh, those proceeds on uh, buying uh, for some goods or services from Russian companies. And uh, we try to negotiate uh, the, this deal, as far as I remember, it's five years. So it took a long time just to negotiate. It was negotiated uh, just in, uh, in last year, but uh, as far as I know, uh, still the volumes that are actually were, that uh, Russia bought from Iran are really low, just one million barrels. So that's it. And just one project is uh, used uh, to finance uh, kind of Iran's spends uh, on buying Russian services uh, for um, electrification of their railways. So Russian railways organizes it and that's it. So from my point of view, even with you know such a huge long, long discussion, long talks, and you know still results are really really modest. It's not to the uh, to the kind of the expectation that were people expected. So there are large problems you know, from, I believe, from the Iranian side and from the Russian side as well. Uh, so just to conclude and to make some general observation about uh, the trade in national currencies. Uh, so as uh, we have talked, US dollar is still the dominant currency of the world. And Euro and uh, Chinese Yuan couldn't really challenge the dominance of the US dollar. And uh, you have to think about the way that if there is a situation, there are some strong incentives, a strong rationale for private agents to use uh, the US dollar as a vehicle for their um, transaction. And uh, I agree that probably one of the kind of reasons why it is so is that the US has uh, the most liquid financial markets in the world. And there is a plenty of instruments to hedge your any your currency risks to invest. There are no limitations. You can move away, move in and out. So there is a strong incentive for private agents to use U.S. dollars. So if we try to to simulate trade in national currencies, we have to create incentive for market agents as well in order to give them. You know, an opportunity to trade in national currencies. And as Russian experience shows, there are, even for largest corporation in the world, there are very serious risks of making currently because of the uh, increased use of the US administration of, of, of the sanction as, uh, as a weapon. You, you can, you know, experience that you cannot actually get the money from your counterparts, or you cannot make a payment on your euro bonds for a kind of banking trade. So that means that you have to deal with that. And uh, major Russian companies try to kind of develop a plan B. For, for example, if in a kind of stress scenario you are included in an SDN list, you kind of your operations shouldn't be stopped. You, you have to have some kind of plan B in order to get things around. And that's why I believe some kind of uh, alternative payment system that is being discussed by European Union, Russia, China, Turkey, India, is a very kind of, it, it has some back, uh, economic you know, rationale for doing it. But in order to make it sustainable, you, the, it should be you know, competitive, for example, with SWIFT. So it, it should, the cost should be lower. And the quality of the service, like in terms of timing, in terms of security, in terms of technological advancement, should be superior than the Swift, for example. If that is the case, they should, then there would be kind of uh, incentives for private actors to use that payment system and not to use Swift, for example. 
Another thing is that uh, quality of economic policy matters a lot, and you have to kind of to have a good monetary fiscal policy in place just in order to stimulate uh, the uh, uh, trade in national currencies. Another thing is that it's not only about trade, it's also about investments. So a favorable investment climate for foreign investment for foreign investors is a key in order to promote uh, to promote trade in national currencies. Uh, and another thing is that uh, from the government point uh, point of view, uh, you really uh, should be ready to kind of to provide some kind of subsidy and you're ready to spend in order to create incentives for people to use your own currency, like special trade financing uh, from the local banks or from National Development Bank in order you know, to promote and stimulate, facilitate trade in national currency. So you have to be ready to spend a little bit on that in order you know, to, to move it forward. And uh, also the development of financial markets is very important, as if you have, uh, you know, developed financial markets with different players, with you know, sport effects market active, with different derivative products is in place. So it helps also to kind of to build all those ecosystem for the for the use of the national currencies. And another thing is that it's also not about the kind of the development of the financial markets, but also about the kind of mutual access from one country to each other. So, for example, if I'm, you know, a Russian passion fund, can I buy some bonds from a Turkish company or not? What are the costs involved in order to, uh, to, to make that deal? Or, for example, if some Turkish bank can, can actually invest in some Russian state government bonds or not? What are the costs of those transactions? It's, it's a very important topic as well in order to facilitate trade in the national currency. And uh, the last point, is that when we talk about uh, the use of the national currencies, most countries, and Russia as well, what it means is we aim to use our own currency. So Russia tries to simulate the use of rubles, India simulates the use of rupees, Turkey, it's about, it's about all lyrics. So it's a, from the economic pers economist perspective, it's a classic prisoner's dilemma, when everyone kind of uh, behaves in, in, in its, their own self-interest, yes, but overall the welfare is lower than if we cooperate with each other and kind of move it forward together. So that's kind of the last point. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Marcel, for the wonderful comment. Uh, uh, Marcel rightfully uh, emphasized the importance of stability, also importance of uh, reducing transaction costs uh, stemming from using national currencies. And these are the uh, important points. Uh, since the uh, withdrawal of uh, Donald Trump uh, from Iranian uh, nuclear deal uh, since the uh, early May, we talk about uh, how European countries is going to save uh, nuclear deal. So uh, the politicians from European Union uh, get together frequently to find some uh, smart way to bypassing the uh, uh, United States uh, secondary sanction. And one of the stuff that recently brought uh, into light uh, by the European uh, politicians about the, uh, the name of this uh, stuff is special purpose vehicle. And uh, but. Uh, the, this uh, instrument was introduced in mid-September, uh, but uh, we did not see concrete steps to make this uh, like more tangible. And uh, when we talk about uh, nuclear sanction and using national currencies, uh, again the spotlights uh, turn into the uh, Iran. We have uh, another uh, guest from uh, Iranian Central Bank and. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, Iranian current economic situation and also he's going to talk about the use of national currency. Since Iran has been uh, on the uh, pressure of uh, American sanctions for almost uh, 40 years, so they have good experience how to bypass uh, those sanctions and probably he's going to give us some clue about uh, some pragmatic approach, uh, how can we save Turkish economy, Russian economy to 
uh, you know, reduce the tension from the American sanction. So uh, Resul Kansari is coming from Iran. He worked for uh, Central Bank for, uh, of Iran for almost uh, eight years. He has a good experience about these issues. So the floor is yours. <coughs> and dollar uh, in world trade and finance is an issue. Many countries accounting for about 60% of global GDP use the greenback as their financial currency. However, the US share of world GDP currently is about 20% uh, 24% uh, decreased from 30% at the end of World War II. China's share, uh, meanwhile, has quadrupled to about 15%. As the Russian President Vladimir Putin uh, said during the BRICS summit, the greenback dominancy is the main uh, cause of global financial and economic uh, crisis. So there is a widespread concern that the U.S. might use the reserve currency status of dollar to impose new uh, sanctions on uh, other countries. Russian foreign, uh, foreign minister Sergei Lavrov previously described the U.S. dollar as a level of pressure saying that Washington uses that when it wants to punish someone. <coughs> so the process of de-dollarization seems to be gathering speed and more countries switch to national countries in trade and use bilateral and multilateral currency swap agreements for settlement of their trades. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan uh, has, called, uh, on, has called on global trading partners to smash the greenbacks monopoly, saying Ankara will push uh, uh, a non-dollar transaction in trade and investment with other countries. So, uh, especially uh, since the 2008 uh, financial crisis, central banks, uh, central banks around the world have entered into multi, uh, multitude of bilateral and uh, multilateral currency swap agreements with each other more than previous. As you know, uh, these agreements allow the central bank of a currency country to exchange currency, usually its domestic currency, for a certain amount of foreign currency. As long as the U.S. Yes, uses the dollar, as my friend said, as an economic defense against other countries, it seems that trade in national currencies and similar mechanisms can be effective tools for countries like Iran, Turkey, and Russia that uh, oppose U.S. imperialists. But Iranian experience uh, that I want to mention, uh, Iran ranks rank second in the world in nat natural gold reserves and fourth in foreign oil reserves. Iran had estimated GDP in uh, 2017 of uh, 447.7 billion dollars. Iran's economy characterized by the hydrocarbon sector, agriculture, and services sectors in and uh, in a noticeable state presence in manufacturing and financial services. As 
as you see in the table, uh, Iran's GDP growth in 2017-18 drops to 3.7% as the effect of large surge in oil revenues uh, in previous year dis uh, And the uh, overwhelming majority of growth came from the non-oil sectors out of which more than half can be attributed to services growing by 4.5%. Uh, In April 2018, the government's unification of official and parallel rates, uh, rates in foreign exchange market has shortened life impact. The parallel market rate has fluctuated on expectation of dollar shortage as the U.S. pulled out uh, of the GPO and GCPOA in May. Uh, by August, uh, Riyadh has uh, had uh, devaluated by about uh, 170 uh, percent over the past uh, 12 months, rising above uh, 100,000 reals per dollar. This has contributed to measured inflation rate returning to 18 percent in July, a rate last seen in uh, March 2014. But uh, after uh, Iran, Russia, and Turkey, three regional allies hit by U.S. sanctions discussed uh, a possible replacement of US, U.S. dollar by national currencies, business figures in Iran are now waning in on uh, the degree the plan can be implemented with success. The discussion which has been on the agenda of, the, of these countries took place at the recent trilateral summit of Syria Syrian ceasefire guarantor states on September 2018. Also, Iranian Central Bank Governor Abdul Nasser Hamati emphasized recently that we have decided to proceed with uh, further work in light of agreements reached at a meeting with uh, Russian Central Bank Governor in Moscow. Uh, Tehran has pursued the goal of eliminating the dollar uh, in its trade and has been trying to sign currency swap agreements with a few target countries. Following the visit uh, the Turkish president to Iran on October 2017, uh, during the visit paid by the governor of the Central Bank of Iran uh, to Turkey, the MOU of bilateral uh, real lira swap uh, was agreed uh, and the two sides allocate 5 billion lira and its uh, real equivalent uh, credit to the agent bank of respective countries to be used for opening documentary credits in favor of the businessmen uh, with a repayment period of one year. Uh, the, the agreement aimed the, uh, at enhancement of bilateral trade based on, uh, based on using the uh, local currencies for trade, <coughs> finance, and direct investment. So the agent banks of both countries could use international payments instruments in local currencies to finance the bilateral trade. Indeed, the specified agent banks are allowed to finance bilateral trading uh, via international payment tools uh, such as letter of credits and remittances in the local currencies. It was agreed that Bank Mali Iran and Turkey's uh, Ziraat Bank uh, signed a, an MOU regarding how to use credit line in local currencies. Recently, Bank Mill Iran opened the first letter of credit to finance trade with Turkey in April 16, 2018. This is a major step since uh, the Islamic Republic previous uh, MOU uh, on this issue with other countries never really came into effect. According to the executive arrangement of this model, the credits for Iranian merchants uh, are nominated in Turkish lira and will be provide, uh, provided from the source of currency swap current, uh, contracts. Uh, regarding the high uh, volume with, uh, trade with Turkey of about $6 billion using national currencies under the executive arrangements of currency swap will contribute significantly to facilitation, banking and commercial ties between two uh, countries. Moreover, a bilateral cooperation agreement uh, between Iran and Russia has been signed 
at the six Iran and Russia Banking and Finance Group Summit, uh, which has hosted by Central Bank of Iran. It's aimed uh, to advance banking relationships and increase uh, volume of trade between two countries. Uh, but as you know, uh, uh, trade in national currency between Iran and its uh, allies like Turkey, Russia, uh, Russia and China can have some advantages, uh, including uh, trade with neighboring uh, improvement, the trade with, uh, with neighboring countries, conducting foreign exchange operations of different entities with the banking system, diversifying international uh, payment tools, reduction in costs and risk of foreign exchange op operations, and most important, to by uh, bypass the U.S. sanctions. Today, uh, there is a good potential for using uh, swap agreements for bilateral or multilateral trade between Iran and other countries. The The last the statistics of Iranian uh, Islamic Republic of Iran Customs Administration demonstrate that Iran's non-oil exports reach to uh, 38.4 billion dollars from the beginning of 2018 uh, to the end of the September with rise of 19.4 percent compared to the same period in last year. During the mentioned period, uh, 30. Uh, $8.59 billion of goods were imported to Iran, which increased about 9.5% uh, uh, compared to the same period in previous year. According to statistics, the main destination countries for non-oil export of Iran are China, United Arab Emirates, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, South Korea, India, Turkey, and Russia. Also imports to Iran are mainly from China, uh, United Arab Emirates, uh, South Korea, Germany, India, Switzerland, and Turkey. It should be noted that Iran's export to Turkey totaled uh, uh, 3.2 uh, billion dollars in first three quarter of 2018, and the volume of imports from this country was uh, 1.7 billion dollars. So there is a suitable potential for payment in local currency for about 54% uh, of mutual trade between two countries. This is for China, United Arab Emirates, South Korea, Russia, and India is about uh, 77, 97, 85, 2, and 23, and 98% respectively. Totally about uh, 20.8 uh, billion dollars of mutual trade between Iran and its partners could be set up uh, by local currency in last months, according to this uh, table we see. Uh, but challenge uh, that we face with them uh, are uh, so many challenges uh, that there are, uh, we should uh, solve them. There are some problems in Iran economy at macro level that may affect the development of trade in national currencies. On the external side, there is uncertainty of impact of U.S. sanctions depending on the adaptation of other trade partners. Domestically, the government faces the economic and social challenges of completing adjustment previous shocks and not really to not only the financial sector restructuring as well as mitigating the evolving impact of oil export decline. Volatility of exchange rate, lack of monetary policy instrument, high level of money supplies, and possibility of high inflation rate, rates are some macroeconomic challenges that can affect the bilateral trade between Iran and other countries. Uh, as uh, my experience has been in banking system, there are some challenges in banking system that we face with them. Banking system, uh, as you know, uh, has a bit of a role in a bilateral trade. However, there is some issues in Iranian banking system, including low capital adequacy in some banks, 
high level of non performing loans and non conforming uh, comfort, uh, fully to IFRS, and that uh, we, can, uh, we are working to solve this issue. Uh, on the other hand, there is some challenge in implementation of uh, bilateral. Uh, trade, uh, trade agreements that we have, we want to have with other countries. The volume of trade between Iran and other countries has been around 77 billion dollars, based on nine previous months of uh, 2000, 2018. This was mainly according to euro and dollar, and trade in national currency has a noticeable sharing Iran's trade with other countries. Indeed, the currency swap between Iran and other countries take up a little percent of the total bilateral trade volume. Therefore, there is a space for further cooperation. Uh, one issue about trade is local currency between Iran and its, par uh, its partners is the dominance of Chinese products in Iranian market. In this situation, competition between the imported goods and our national products will be difficult to maintain. Uh, as our local manufacturer products will struggle with indices such as price, availability, and quality, and this will lead to a dominance of Chinese pro uh, goods and products in the Iranian market. So we need to diversify our market with other countries like India, Russia, Turkey, Pakistan, etc. Another important issue uh, regarding to trading national currencies in that is that the involved parties might employ them to remove the currency of the uh, a, a certain uh, country in settlement of the bilateral business interaction. But even this will not eliminate the need for uh, a major third currency as settlement currency completely since, as it said, commodities markets are mostly dollar dominated. So emerging economies should develop their banking link links and also underline the unfairness of existing financial system dominated by few developed, uh, developed countries. Lack of cooperation and cooperating uh, some bureaucratic uh, process for opening bank accounts in foreign banks, problem in transferring revenues from Iran export to other countries like Russia and Turkey, barriers uh, to the letters of credit provisions and impossibility of transferring remittances are other obstacles to bilateral trade with local currency <coughs> between Iran and other countries. The Central Bank of Iran has highlighted the requirements for trading national currencies with other countries. First, the exchange rate of its uh, intermediary currencies and the conversion mechanism to settle local currencies. Second, uh, the trade balance uh, and outstanding debts between respective countries involved in the uh, swap agreements. And third, the political will of countries uh, and the, their central banks to implement the deal. The third is very important and uh, to uh, in effect the uh, bilateral trade. At present, due to the high foreign exchange rate volatility in Iran, the CBI is not capable of easing the processing of international exchange transactions in an effective manner. On the other hand, this is, uh, its policy of controlling the foreign exchange market may put at risk Iran foreign exchange reserves, while the latter recently helped push down the real to record loss. Uh, it's contributed to Iran national currency losing its uh, attraction as an intermediary monetary unit in banking of foreign swap agreements. Indeed, neither Iran nor its peers uh, might be in a position to guarantee the extent of fluctuation of their currencies. Let's give some material to save my time. Uh, another issue is uh, that the countries like Iran can benefit more from bilateral trades when they say a higher share of global market. This could materialize provided that business friendly indices are improved, uh, well diverse, uh, diverse uh, well devised industrial strategies are established and 
Good governance is embedded in the actions of top officials in, in the political uh, system. Uh, actually, a currency swap deal will work only if the if the, it is a win-win for both countries. The trading partners should uh, have sufficient trade and investment with each other. In this regard, we can have a common strategic plan to where uh, win our countries of dollar dependence. I believe that it is feasible, but it is expected to be a long and complicated process. Anyway, this trend is inevitable not only for Iran, but also for uh, the global economy. There is other, also other ways um, to strength the, strengthen the role of the other currencies. It should uh, also unit in uh, cre creating a payment channel that can be uh, controlled, uh, can, uh, cannot be controlled uh, by the U United States. Uh, Iranian banks, uh, US uh, political decision in uh, 2012 to remove Iranian banks from SWIFT immediately set up uh, alarm bells for several countries. They need to escape from the possibility of being excluded from SWIFT become urgent for countries under the threat of Washington. The alternative to SWIFT interbank settlement network that could bypass sanction uh, could be seen as the first step in that direction. So uh, an alternative payment system was thus learned in uh, 2015 uh, Christine the cross-border interbank payment system SIPS, uh, unsurprising, founded by China. As I said, a more radical solution has been sought by Venezuela with uh, the uh, country creating its own virtual currency. But uh, some policy measures that uh, we do, uh, we did for uh, correcting and uh, improvement the bilateral trade in Iran, with Iran and other countries. Uh, holding negotiations and working to set up a messaging system for financial and banking transaction as an alternative uh, to SWIFT. As uh, our political uh, authorities said, uh, it, was, uh, it will be uh, effective uh, soon, uh, an alternative for SWIFT uh, as a messaging system. Following up, Iran, uh, Iran's membership in Banking Committee of Shanghai Cooperation Organization as an observer member, signing an agreement of, uh, on financial and banking cooperation between Iran and Russia on July 2018. Uh, drafting a new act on banking system in Iran's parliament. It, uh, the new law is uh, about banking and central banking that have many uh, adjustments to previous law. Finding uh, new customers for buying Iran's oil, to diversifying our customers uh, to uh, selling oil. Uh, designing support package by, uh, by Iran's, uh, Iran's government and parliament to counter US sanctions in various areas of monetary banking and currency sector, liquidity management, and uh, deterring uh, middlemen uh, disruption and negative interference optimization of foreign exchange reserve management, uh, facilitation, money transferring in international market, reduction of intermediary currency rule, providing strategic commodities and budget resources. Uh, and one major uh, step that we uh, done is the tangible progress in customs reform in Iran supported by Iran's Iranian customs single window system uh, as a result of rolling of the system, the uh, clearing time has been reduced dramatically from uh, 26 to 3 days uh, for important import and from 7 to 1 day for export. And uh, 27 government agencies are now connected to the uh, custom system window. Designing and uh, Deployment for new monetary policy instrument by CBI to stabilizing foreign exchange rate and to better control of foreign exchange uh, market in Iran. Uh, one important issue in Iran is there is not enough uh, Sharia compliant uh, monetary instrument for uh, conducting monetary policies. And we are uh, de developing the new instrument for uh, issues uh, to solve this issue.
Requirement for, uh, for full implementation of IFRS by all companies, especially financial institutions. Uh, organizing workshops and training courses for bank employee, employees and uh, so private sector uh, to obtain the necessary skills in activities relating to bilateral trade in banking systems. Planning a launch national cryptocurrency, partly in response to crippling economic sanctions. This is under process uh, uh, national cryptocurrency for uh, bypass the US sanctions. However, the volatility of uh, the currencies like real lira and rupee uh, is a major issue for trade in national currencies and the dollarization of our economies. And therefore, the central banks of this country have to play a more effective role to stabilizing their, uh, their currencies for using them in the international trade operation. Uh, one solution can be hedge currency risk, at least with the help of uh, options, futures, and etc. We are working uh, on development and foreign exchange derivatives uh, market, uh, Sharia component foreign exchange derivatives market, to provide some mechanisms for exchange rate risk. Uh, management exchange risk. risk. A strong uh, clearing system is also needing, uh, needed for payments in national currency. Uh, we could uh, use the experience of European countries in establish, uh, establish, establishing the euro as a common currency between many countries, which is not uh, exclusively uh, controlled by a single country. <coughs> Uh, funding and establishing uh, a binational bank uh, bank is another approach for facilitation, facilitation trade uh, in national currency. In fact, establishing joint venture banks by two or more countries can have some benefits, including facilitating and increasing the process of trade and economic transaction and mutual banking operation for investing countries. I think that funding a multinational bank between Tehran, Moscow, and Ankara can be, uh, can be useful to enhance mutual trade between three countries. In short, I can say that uh, Iran's efforts uh, to use national currency in trade with main partners like Turkey, Russia, uh, and India and China have recently accelerated. Iran is eager to use national currencies instead of the US dollar to trade with other countries, especially those who are, uh, who are facing by economic sanctions. We are trying to resist against unfair sanctions and to improve our international relationship, especially with our friends. As said, our supreme leader, uh, economic sanctions are more fragile than all national economies. Thank you. Thank you. That's all for this uh, very uh, extensive uh, presentation. And uh, finally, uh, I am going to give floor to Abdukadir uh, Hoca. Uh, thank you for your patience. Okay, it is a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, once upon a time, the study was the economic power in the world, you know that but it was overtaken by the dollar. And uh, we hope that it will change with the advent of the euro in the international markets. But I can say that the, the economic power of the dollar is still going on. And so the world economy is growing, especially the, the GDP level of the developing country also increased. And depending on, on the GDP, the dollar demand also increases. This is a kind of circulations. You want to diminish your dollar currency in international markets, but depending on, on your GDP and your production and your services, uh, demand of the dollar also increase. And so, how can what can we do against of the dollar dominance in, in, in the world? We should understand that. Because for most of the commodity of the, in the world, uh, pricing, uh, double pricing, and energy and other commodity. And so, if you cannot pass uh, double dominance with related to this uh, uh, oil and the, uh, and the aluminium and the steel, you cannot 
uh, decrease the power of the endowment, we can say that. And so, most of the, my friends talk about the, the, the prominence of the dollar in international economics, and so I will pass that, that, that issue, but, but I will focus on the current situation of the United States and the world. You know that the GDP of the United States, last, uh, according to the last quart quarter, increased over 4.3, and uh, this is a very incredible uh, economic growth for the United States, and unemployment level is under the four persons. 3.9, uh, and that, that, that, that is the under the national unemployment level. And so, that is the kind of, the source of this economic growth is the, is the uh, power of the, the dollar. And so, when you wake up early, and then you follow what Trump says today about any country. If, it, for example, if Trump talks about Saudi Arabia, and then the exchange rates of Saudi Arabia started to uh, fluctuate. Uh, and so that is the kind of economic crisis for, for Saudi Arabia. You know that we also have a, a crisis with the United States uh, for three months, and uh, our currency also affected the situation negatively. Uh, but before the, uh, before the Turkey, I will mention about the, uh, again, the current stations of the United States. They want to de increase their interest rates, in fact, decide to increase their interest rates. What is the purpose of this policy of the Fed to take the money from the international markets? And so uh, they succeeded. Uh, till the 2020, the United States plan, planning to take the two trillion dollar from the international markets. That is really, a, really a huge amount. And so, after that, we cannot talk about the abundance of the dollar in international markets. And so, let's talk about European Central Banks, and they uh, put to international markets uh, uh, about. 15 trillion euro for a, for a month. But after October, they start to decrease the level of the money supply, euro supply to the international markets. And so, uh, maybe middle of the next year, uh, they will plan it to how we take, how we collect, collect the euro from the international markets. And so, for the euro and for the dollar, we cannot talk about anymore the abundance. And so, uh, local government and less developed markets should think about that. How we can, how we can, we can decrease the dependence of uh, the dollar and the euro uh, in coming years. And so, we are going on, on a new stage, and the inflation rates and the interest rate will be high because of the high cost of the euro and dollar. Uh, based on Fed and Euro European Central Bank the policy, and so we have to pass it now. So, uh, let's talk about the energy, for example. Uh, OPEC country produce around 100 uh, billion barrel uh, oil for a day and pumping all over the world with the doubt. And this is another source of the doubt. You cannot uh, decrease the dependence of the dollar without energy. And so we think about that. An OPEC country produce a really high amount of the dollars with the oil to the world. And so such a country, a country like, like us, we are the dollar, dollar pricing and energy dependency country. We have a budget deficit. We have, we have a current account deficit. And we have also dependence on the energy. So both of them affect the country so much, like us. And this is another issue. Uh, my friends talk about the Russia. Russia has a really abundant energy sources. And so uh, any crisis related to that will affect Russia, Russia, Russia less than us. And so we, we will also think about that. And so, Dollar power, power of the dollar will go on like that because of the also invoicing of the country export. Uh, all goods and services in the, in the world uh, pricing the dollar. 
And you cannot diminish the hegemony of the power. Uh, so, your economy is growing, your export is growing, your import is growing, but depending on it, them, you are also dependent on the dollar increase. And so we need a cooperation here. We need a kind of integrations. Uh, for example, D8, uh, you know that, and Turkey and uh, Iran was the member of the D8. The, the, the first, yes, yes, in Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, Iran, and the Nigeria, uh, and the, the Egypt. Egypt was a really, we, we have a really huge population, huge energy resources. And we need a common currency here. We cannot succeed uh, without the cooperation and integrations. And Turkey cannot pass its domestic currency without any cooperations and any integrations. And so we, we, we, we try to uh, provide it with our neighbor country and the other integrations here is there. And another things, for example, uh, European Union, you know that uh, the role of the Euro is expected to increase the, in international league, but it was not happening because it remains locally, regionally, amongst the, amongst the European countries. And so, let's come back to the BRICS, for example. BRICS country is huge uh, populations, and uh, GDP, and the energy resources. And so we need a kind of cooperation between central banks of the BRICS country. And that is a technical issue, and really difficult. Because all of your currency depending on the dollar here. And so, let's talk about Turkey. Uh, what happens last three years, you know that? The value of the dollar increased. That, that is the process of depreciation of the Turkish lira. And depending on that, we have a high inflation rates, over 20 persons. And also, as I mentioned, we are depending on the energy. And the pricing of the energy is the dollar. And we have a mutual dependency here is there. And also, we need a financial requirement from the rest of the world. We have a budget, we have a foreign uh, budget deficits, we have a current account deficit, we have a foreign trade deficits. And so we have to meet uh, this deficit by the way of the, uh, the dollar funds. We have uh, three ways to meet our, uh, our uh, dependency. One of them is the, you know, that foreign direct investments. And it depends on the stability of the country. And the second one also is, is, is the long and uh, stable credit with the low cost. And the last one is the, depending on the interest rate, the hard money. And also, if you talk about the Turkey, you should rethink the neighbor country. Uh, Unless, uh, do you know the condition of the Iraq under the sanction of the United States? And that, as you see the, also the condition of the Iraq and Syria, and those are the political, uh, economic, political and economically instable country, and that makes Turkey's foreign trade worse, maybe. And so, uh, we also, the problem of the dollarizations, like the other country, if there is any kind of economic crisis, we're going to the dollar, going to the euro. That, that is not good. With the higher interest rates, rates we want to take, we want to receive money from the rest of the world. But if you look at the domestic markets, and uh, domestic markets, it, we increase our dollar, dollar level. Uh, that is not good. Last month, we increased the dollar, dollar level about 1.2 billion dollars. We increased the, our interest rate to receive the money, to receive the direct investment, but uh, we also increased our dollar reserve in our country. 
And so we have to give up to this policy also again. And uh, I think that's enough for me. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just want to give a small summary and then I am going to ask the audience if they have any questions and then I am going to ask each participant to give some brief conclusion. Today what we learn is, first of all, honestly, dollar domination in global financial system is creating some problems. Okay, we accept this, but at the end of the day, after all the presentation, we also learned that each country has lots of to do. We have some homework to do. Uh, unfortunately, because of uh, we are neighboring country with Russia, with Iran, and because of historical disputes among these nations, we unfortunately live in a world there is a uh, not a significant amount of trust between these neighboring countries. And generally, the relation between these countries contaminated with the uh, past historical rivalries. Uh, that is one homework that we have to work through. Another important stuff is if we expand cooperation, uh, we see that uh, some concrete result can be achieved, especially particularly uh, last two years with the cooperation with the, uh, Turkey, Russia, and Iran. We have like you know, lots of uh, maneuvers uh, in Syria, in, in, in Qatar. So uh, when we cooperate, I think, and we if we uh, expand our relation, uh, there might be more concrete steps that we can take. Another important stuff uh, for financial uh, issue, we uh, understand that the stability of uh, domestic economy is a precondition for good uh, uh, policy in terms of using national currency. So the, uh, each country, when it's engaged using national currency, it has to f first do its own homework and stabilize its macroeconomy. Another important stuff is we have to uh, stimulate foreign direct investment among these nations to, because uh, direct investment, tourism, uh, not only create jobs, but also improve uh, uh, relation among these nations. Another, again, important stuff is in order to facilitate nation, using national currency, we have to legal structures. So the politicians uh, talk about uh, using national currency, but first of all, as a precondition, we have to satisfy those legal institutional setup which can uh, facilitate using national currency. And uh, another stuff uh, I am going to uh, uh, talk about, let me check my uh, uh, notes, uh, and also in terms of uh, specific uh, Iranian case, Iran has uh, particularly one of the worst cases in among us in here because uh, Iran is uh, under the significant amount of pressure from the U.S. sanction. But as far as we understand, when we look at Iranian case, there are lots of domestic homework uh, uh, on behalf of Iran. But unfortunately, because the governmental system in Iran is working a little bit too slowly, uh, during those even the most ten uh, tense period, we have sometimes difficulty in improving uh, economic trade with Iran. For example, both Rouhani and Tayyip Erdogan put specific target to improve Turkish and Iranian trade to $30 billion. And uh, we all, always uh, talk about Turkish and Tayyip Erdogan about uh, their relation in Iran and they frequently bring this issue. We have some difficulty uh, in uh, our entrepreneurial activity in Iran because of uh, this dualistic uh, state structure. We have to take lots of uh, permission, we face lots of bureaucratic stuff. Uh, maybe uh, there are some Iranian uh, uh, personnel from uh, Iranian embassy, so we can uh, emphasize this point. Turkish entrepreneurs are ready to make uh, increase uh, their uh, presence in Iran, but they always come to us and uh, share their experience and they frequently bring this issue. Iran is a very tough country. We want to do more trade, but uh, when we get into the field, we frequently face with challenges because of domestic structure and because of bureaucracy. So we have to work on that. This is a homework on behalf of Iran. Maybe Iran should do 
more on uh, its own homework to uh, uh, promote uh, bilateral trade between Iran, Turkey, and Russia. Probably Russia also uh, faces similar challenges in terms of Iran. So I would like to thank all participants, and I would like to uh, ask audience if they have any uh, question regarding, uh, uh, like you know, your personal or your uh, the, uh, financial question to our presenters. <coughs> Türkçe'de sorun sorusu olan var mı? Türkçe'de sorun sorusu olan var mı? Türkçe'de sorun sorusu olan var mı? Türkçe'de sorun sorusu olan var mı? Türkçe'de sorun sorusu olan var mı? Türkçe'de sorun sorusu olan var mı? Türkçe'de sorun sorusu olan var mı? Türkçe'de sorun sorusu olan var mı? Türkçe'de sorun sorusu olan var mı? Türkçe'de sorun sorusu olan var mı? Türkçe'de sorun sorusu olan var mı? Türkçe'de sorun sorusu olan var mı? Türkçe'de sorun sorusu olan var mı? Türkçe'de sorun sorusu olan var mı? Türkçe'de sorun sorusu olan var mı? Türkçe'de sorun sorusu olan var mı? Türkçe'de sorun sorusu olan var mı? Türkçe'de sorun sorusu olan var mı? Türkçe'de sorun sorusu olan var mı? Türkçe'de sorun sorusu olan var mı? Türkçe'de sorun sorusu olan var mı? Türkçe'de sorun sorusu olan var mı? Türkçe'de sorun sorusu olan var mı? Türkçe'de sorun sorusu olan var mı? Türkçe'de sorun sorusu olan var mı? Türkçe'de sorun sorusu olan var mı? Türkçe'de sorun sorusu olan var mı? Türkçe'de sorun sorusu olan var mı? Türkçe'de sorun sorusu olan var mı? Türkçe'de sorun sorusu olan var mı? Türkçe'de sorun sorusu olan var mı? Türkçe'de sorun sorusu olan var mı? Türkçe'de sorun sorusu olan var mı? Türkçe'de Actually, uh, now we uh, see the two different uh, types of counter context uh, for the uh, uh, for the uh, uh, trading national currencies. In some case, it is just the maybe temporary reactionary uh, the approach uh, with the influence of sanctions. But for other case, it's a part of uh, maybe long term long term strategy on. Uh, uh, internationalization of currency. So, what could be the, the proper strategy here? That it is possible to succeed in the trading national currencies with main tra trade partners uh, without this kind of uh, uh, strategy properly, uh, well functioning strategy on internationalization of national currency. Uh, that, that's the first issue. The second issue here is that, again, the, in, in case of uh, India and in case of uh, Russia, it, maybe it's a little bit different situation than Iran and Turkey. Because in, in Europe's cases, uh, we have a little bit different model. There is one uh, core country in the center with maybe a relatively uh, big economic power and small peripheral countries around it. In case of Russia, it's a whole Soviet, relatively small countries. In, the, in case of uh, India, it's uh, countries like Nepal, Bhutan, etc. But in the case of Iran and, and Turkey, the, the, the main partners with the, the countries negotiate and trade in national currencies have a relatively uh, the same size of trade and economy. So these kind of trade asymmetries, asymmetries uh, matter in this long-term strategy or not? That's my second question. Thank you. Merhaba, benim ismim Recep Kemal Kuzu. Misafirler kulaklıkları da alsınlar. Tamam. Benim sorum Abdullah hocam olacak. Şimdi... Şöyle en baştan beri konuşmaları dinlediğimde eleştiri, soru bir de öneriyle yoğrulmuş bir yorum yapmak istiyorum. Şöyle ki şimdi hep bu aslında şu anki durum tepkisel bir durum. Biz hep böyle olmuş. Yani Amerika eğer böyle yaptırımları uygulamasa ne İran, ne Türkiye, ne işte Rusya, ne Hindistan böyle bir tepki göstermeyecek. Ben bunun yerine şöyle bir şey yapılsa daha iyi olmaz yani e, bence bu yerel paraları kullanmak biraz daha eskide kaldı gibi. Sanal para kullanılmaya başlanmış, işte bitcoin tartışılıyor bilmem ne yani böyle e, daha sana, hayatımız sanallaşırken biz hala yerel paralarla ticaret yapabilir miyiz tartışmak biraz daha bana komik gibi. Hele e, bu dolarizasyonun %90 gibi bir %88'di hocamın gördüğüm şeyinde %90'a yakın bir dolarizasyon var. Ve bunu yenebilecek bir alternatif bir şey olması lazım. Yerel paralara dönmek bence çok mantıklı gibi gelmiyor. Bunun yerine sanal paralarla hareket etmek daha makul gibi geliyor. Tepki göstermektense böyle tepki verilecek bir şeyler yapmalıyız ki bu işi başaralım. Ee, Abdullah Hocam ne düşünüyor bu konuda merak ediyorum. Başka sorusu var. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I would uh, like to thank the uh, uh, precious teachers who had very good uh, 
uh, presentations here. Uh, I want to ask uh, Marcel uh, Salihon. Uh, you say that uh, using national currencies are like a prisoner uh, dilemma. So, so what is your suggestion here? Uh, should we use uh, multinational currency here or uh, an international currency here? What is your suggestion here? Thank you. I'm Rahim Mullah from uh, Foreign Policy Department of Iran. My question is to our guest from Russia. Uh, as I conclude today, uh, there are many huge difficulties in using national currencies. Uh, in your opinion, uh, what if, if the, these countries succeed? Uh, what kind of effect this might have on global uh, finan financial system? Uh, uh, is it going to make a trend? And uh, will we see the other countries uh, moving away from uh, dollar in the near future? Thank you. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your uh, presentation. I have a question of Mr. Abdul Qadir. Uh, can we talk about the Islamic currency? under the OIC countries. This is a good idea that you were talking about the eight, the eight countries. Uh, do you think uh, Islamic countries are willing to have uh, such currencies? Thank you. Considering uh, Friday prayer, uh, yes, yes. Uh, I would like to <coughs> give your answer and then I am going to give more to the uh, closing remarks. And start so with the I'm sorry, I didn't see. Uh, I didn't pull it from your university. My question is regarding the surf payment system. Uh, it, it might be a little bit technical question, though. But, uh, if we have two different payment systems, it, that means that the buyers and sellers have to use two systems together. Except we, we just you know make it mandatory to use only one system. Uh, for instance, if you are going to buy products from US or Europe, uh, we have to use SWIFT. And for the local currencies, we have to use the other system. Using two systems means there are two different you know costs arising from the you know, double systems. So if we are going to think about the um, alternative payment system, we have to use central banks instead of using or creating another <coughs> channel. So this is just a comment and who is willing to, you know, uh, contribute to my question. Well. I'll try and be as short as possible, considering the constraints. Uh, first, uh, can we uh, make our currency be the currency in which people trade and do uh, invoicing without making it an international currency? Not really, and that was really what I think I was also saying and Marcel was also saying, that while we do want it to be uh, the currency of invoice and we do want trade in local currency, but because we are so hesitant in making it international, because we don't want the risks, we want to have our cake and eat it too. That is really the problem, and that is why it doesn't take off, because people should be allowed to use it, otherwise they don't want it. Uh, the, your second question on uh, the situation of Iran and Turkey being different, uh, yes, of course, I mean, you know, the reason why we are able to have uh, Nepal, Bhutan, or some of the Russian currencies is because despite it not being an international currency, is because we are the large dominant trading partner, and where that is not the case, then it is difficult. And um, let me just jump to the third question. I think you're absolutely spot on that cryptocurrencies that the domination of the dollar is not going to go away unless we start thinking differently. And it's already happening. I mean, it's just that our central banks, I certainly know that the Reserve Bank of India is trying to reduce trade in cryptocurrencies, trying to prevent it, trying to bring all kinds of uh, obstacles and restrictions on the way. And that is 
perhaps n not good. They're not going to succeed because that's the way the world is going. And the solution may actually lie. I'm not saying that the, it's already there. But the direction of the solution it may already lie in going for cryptocurrencies so that you get away from the dominance of the dollar. And instead of trying to prevent that, many of our central banks should be thinking of, is that the way we can actually solve the problem? I mean, for us to buy uh, oil from Iran, if it was through crypto, we won't have to be facing US sanctions. Yeah, so I'll also try to be short. So on Kenneth's question, uh, whether you know it's, uh, the current discussion is forced by sanction story or is it kind of long-term thing, I think it's it's both. Like sanction, they are really factor that you cannot rule out. So every company and every, as our discussion shows, every major country thinks about what's how to live in this. The sanctions world, whether there are increased risks of sanctions against you. So that's, and it should force us to think long term about how to stimulate it in a kind of efficient manner. As uh, I agree with Professor Euler that uh, dollar dominancy will not go away in near future. So it's a kind of strategy for 10, 20, 30 years in order to how to shape uh, overall economic policy, how to develop special instruments in order to increase our uh, kind of uh, new system more based on national currency usage, both for trade and both for, uh, for savings as uh, kind of reserve uh, currencies. And um, about just one short point about cryptocurrencies, of course there are lots of kind of uh, speculation about hopes that it's kind of a new thing that will help to change the dominant uh, structure of the global financial architecture. But if you think about it uh, and compare the alternatives, like cryptocurrencies are much more volatile than any currency. So even Lira, Russian rubble seems safe heaven compared with any cryptocurrency. And for example, making any transaction, for example, with Bitcoin, will you know take two, three days and will cost you more than any interbank transaction. So it's not really economically feasible uh, to make currently uh, to significant move to cryptocurrencies. Maybe you know in, in some future, in 20, 30 years, it will be another story. But currently, as of now, it's still very infant thing and it's not uh, ready for some kind of really production scale global financial instrument. Uh, and uh, the question about uh, prisoner's dilemma, what's kind of the, the uh, future, what can you suggest? Uh, I think that there are some, uh, if you think about dollar dominance, uh, there, are, there is a very strong kind of economic foundations on why there is one currency is dominant. As for example, we all uh, speak in English between us. Because if you speak, speak in different languages, it's really, you know, a lot of transactions, a lot of communications should be going in different languages. That's why there is one language kind of lingua franca, and everybody uses it. And for historical reasons, it's English. So that's why for, even uh, for kind of global financial architecture, there is a very strong kind of rationale uh, to, to, to use one currency. It was maybe you know, pound in, in the past, now it's dollar, and probably will still move some, still some future currency will be dominant. And it's it, it's it's it's logical thing to do. And in order to kind of to challenge the current situation, we I need we think to, about uh, the costs and about the kind of the superior superiority of new solutions, because uh, existing solutions they have some economic advantages, and in order the, to shift that, you have to provide some economic advantages. Like any payment system, like new payment system, as I said, should be cheaper, should be more reliable, should be kind of uh, take less time. And uh, there are, I think that there are, you can do that because old technologies, they kind of are forced, uh, they, they are influenced by decisions that were made you know, 50 years ago. And you can, you know, analyze their experience and to make new decisions and to, to use new technologies in a more efficient, 
managed, then because you, are, you do not have all the history of all those you know, uh, solutions. Um, and about the global financial system future, it's, I've said that it, should, it, it will gravitate uh, gradually towards the increased use of other currencies. It may be in, you know, in 12, 30 years, Chinese currency will become the dominant. I don't know. But there are strong forces why uh, still the global financial architecture gravitates to one, one dominant currency. And I think that will be the case. Thank you. Okay, we need we need a regional currency or the global currency if you bypass the dollar as a common currency. And if you talk about the, the Bitcoin, uh, it can be a kind of reserve money in the future. Uh, my answer is it, it depends on its reliability and uh, demand. And you know that the value of the Bitcoin decreased drastically uh, nowadays. And so I'm not sure about uh, uh, the Bitcoin in the future. Okay, D8 is another question. And so uh, we have a potential to succeed, but where are questions? Where are some problems? If you look at the. Uh, oh, I see. Yes. Islamic. Yes, Islamic currency, you have your questions that, okay? Uh, if you look at the integration process of European Union, firstly, they developed the trade level among the country, and they succeeded the common economic regions, and then by they passed the, the political uh, process. And at that point, they reached the, the common currency in 1999, and that is the process of the uh, a promise of 40 years, I think, and it's a really long time. And so, firstly, we should remove all the abstract uh, amongst the country. Uh, we should succeed in that. And we need the corporations. We need uh, the, uh, we, we have to enhance the uh, economic activity among the country, and we have to remove all the conflicts. Let's uh, talk about uh, the political stations of the Egypt and the Iran and Turkey. Uh, so how can we provide a coherency amongst the country? How can we find a better way to uh, develop the integrations about, about the country? But I'm sure that the populations of those countries want the kind of new currency uh, for the Islamic world. I think I'm sure about that. And we have another chance, we have a, a, a, also an energy, and we, we can start from that, I think, the energy pricing systems. We can change the dollar with the other currency, local currency or global currency, I don't know, but the, the world needs, I think, that. Ben e, konuşmamı kısa kesmiştim. E, Murat Hocam'dan e, söz hakkı e, istedim. Bana göre bugünün en güzel sorularından bir tanesini gözlük bir gerçek kardeşimiz sordu. E, Türkiye Cumhuriyeti de e, bugün kriz geldikten sonra e, bir takım şeylerin önlemini almaya e, kalkması geçmişte yapması gereken bir takım e, tedbirleri ötelemesinden kaynaklanan ağır bir e, sıkıntıya sebebiyet verdi. Yani TL ile ticareti geçmişte bugünkü krizden önce almış olsaydık bu krizi daha hafif atlatmamıza sebebiyet e, vermiş olacaktı. E, Rusya'dan misafirimizin çok güzel bir e, söylemi vardı. Herkes her ülke kendi çıkar ve menfaatleri doğrultusunda bir takım şeyler yönetmeye kalkıyor ee, ve e, bir sistemden de hepimiz şikayet ediyoruz. Eğer bir sistemden şikayet ediyorsak o zaman ülkelerin de ortak çıkarlarını ortaya koyup buna göre bir çözüm bulmamız gerekiyor. Ee, İran hükümetiyle çok yakın diyalog olan e, bir ülkeyiz. Ama karşılıklı ticaret hacmimizin rakamlarının ne olduğunu hepimiz görüyoruz. Ee, i̇ki kardeş ülkenin e, Cumhurbaşkanlarının hedef belirlediği 
e, ticari rakamlar var. 30 milyar dolar rakamı konuşuyoruz. Ama şu anda yapılan ticaret hacimlerimiz komik rakamlar. Bu gerek e, Rusya'yla da e, geçmişte e, yaşanılan istenmeyen bir takım hadiseler ticari e, hacimlerimizi ciddi manada sıkıntıya soktu. Ben bir iş adamı olarak özellikle e, gelişmiş ülkeler seviyesindeki hukuk sistemini oturması ve e, siyaseten yaşanan bir takım sıkıntıların da ticareti bu kadar etkilememesi bizim en büyük hayallerimizden bir tanesi. Asıl konuşmamız gereken konulardan bir tanesi de bu olmalı. Eğer e, siyasiler bazı kararları alırsa tüccarlar ticareti kolaylaştıracak birçok argümanları çeşitlendirebilir. Bu yerel para birimleri olabilir. Ee, birçok dediğim gibi mal takasıyla ticaret yapılabilir. Evet gelişmiş e, ve e, gelişen bir dünyada e, konuşmamız gereken sanat para e, söz konusu bugün zaten dünya o tarafa doğru gidiyor. Ama ben size ait olmayan argümanların yarın başka sıkıntılar da çıkartabileceğini düşünüyorum. E, dolayısıyla her ülkenin ortak menfaati ve çıkarları doğrultusunda bir şeylerin tesis edilmesi lazım ki yarın bir gün dolardaki sıkıntının bir başka oluşturulacak argümanda da yaşanmaması e, gerektiğini düşünüyorum. E, öncelikle e, masanın başında oturan ülkelerin e, siyasileri ve tüccarları irade koyarak ticaret rakamlarımızın olması gereken seviyelere getirilmesi olması gereken seviyeye gelinen bir ticaret hacminde de e, tüccarlar e, bir şekilde para birimini de çözer e, ticareti de bir şekilde halleder diye düşünüyorum. E, çünkü bununla alakalı birçok örnekleri var. Venezuela ile şu anda petrol karşılığında e, Türkiye ticaret yapıyor ya da işte başka türlü şeyleri var. Bizim en büyük açıklarımızdan bir tanesi enerji. İki tane ülke enerji e, olan e, alan ve zenginlikleri olan ülke. Ama şu anda e, bu ülkelerle yaptığımız ticaret hacmi bizi mutlu eden hacimler değil. Bunların bu seviyeye çıkartılması bizim beklentimiz. Teşekkür ediyorum. I don't have extra points, but I just say that the U.S. sanctions always mainly exist, and we have to start develop solutions and different solutions. Also, the, that the, uh, one, uh, some of them are not practical, like frequencies uh, today. But we have to start uh, the solutions and uh, solve the problem. Uh, as our foreign minister, Dr. Zarif, uh, said that uh, the U.S. Uh, addicted to sanctions, but uh, we grow in habit of resistance against sanctions, and we have to uh, develop different solutions to solve this uh, problem uh, and uh, the bilateral trade and multilateral trade uh, maybe uh, can be a, a good solution to uh, solve this problem. Uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, on behalf of Center for Iranian Studies, I would like to thank uh, all these distinguished guests. Uh, they are coming from uh, far away, India, Russia and Iran and also from Ankara. And thank you for, uh, very much for your attendance, uh, for participants and uh, of audience. And I hope uh, we will meet another uh, Iran meetings in the future. Thanks a lot. <laughs>